Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm Phil, joined by John and Logan today. It's episode 102. And on today's episode, we will be talking about uh, starting and starting projects, as long, along with uh, some shop updates and whatever else comes up. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. So I want to thank everybody who's been listening. I uh, want to read a comment here from Steve from the last episode. Way to go, guys. As you turn the page to 101, good talk today, always inspiring. Thank you, Steve. And another EG Blue Suede says, really nice looking clock, Phil. I'm not joking when I say I start thinking about Christmas 2022 already, though just noodling out some ideas. See, there's other people Mm -hmm. in there that start thinking about Christmas projects right away. Weirdos. We're not weird. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is, and I want to get your opinion on it, is as we've discussed in the past, my workshop is in an unheated garage. And I'm from Wisconsin, so I can tolerate some cold. But when it's below zero, my little radiant quartz heater does not do diddly jack. Mm -hmm. So it's cold outside. Which is funny. And I haven't because I I I haven't been in it, and it was it was pretty it was pretty nice. Oh yeah, it works pretty well. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, in the fall it was nice. Well, that's that's true. That's true. It's not. It wasn't zero degrees out. Right. So I haven't really spent measurable time in my shop since prior to Christmas, I believe, which is frustrating to me. And I, I don't think of it consciously, but I know that it affects my attitude if I don't get shop time. So I don't know if that makes me a junkie maybe, or, (laughs) uh, but anyway, when, when these kind of time periods happen where I don't get a lot of shop time, I start daydreaming about projects that I want to do. And then I sort of start them so that I'll like gather parts together from my, whatever I have as a wood collection or whatever, and start putting things together daydreaming or sketching out ideas, but then I don't get shop time to work on it. So that project is then sort of dead to me. And then I start something else. Mm -hmm. So in the last three weeks, probably I've started, started physically probably three projects and head started probably at least three others, if not more. What's my malfunction? No, just Mm -hmm. in general, just to build stuff. No, I'm kind of same way. I like to like gather my little daydream project parts into little piles and then they kind of sit for a while or they get to a certain point where, you know, I kind of forget about them or lose motivation and get to the point where I have to do sanding or finishing. It's just not as fun. So. Right. But I'm kind of the same as you. My home shop is not heated. So when we moved in in November, everything kind of got just thrown into the garage and there it sits waiting for spring. So because that's kind of when I get more a little bit more free time, I can at home when you can jump into the shop and work on stuff here and there when I'm right there. And but yeah, so we wait. And there's also, I've found, and I'm sure this is probably more common, I have a much higher enthusiasm for projects that I want to do compared to projects that I should do. Correct. Extra credit's always more fun. (laughs) (laughs) That it is. Yeah. I don't know. I can kind of relate with my kids because 
there's been times when I've like packed up like baby toys or toys they don't play with as much into totes and put them away. But then when we find them, they get all excited like they're brand new toys. So it's like I got my little project starter kits all scrolled right. away and then you find them and you kind of, oh, this is kind of exciting. And you, you know, put to the side what you were supposed to be working on and tinker around with those for a little bit. And Speaking of which, isn't one of those project kits sitting in the photo studio, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. It's like a little like display curio cabinet that at the time it was like a really cool thing that I needed. And like now there's just no need for it. <laughs> I don't know. I have found a lot of like knickknacky stuff in totes though. When we moved, that's like, I think it was, these were gifts for, for our wedding or something, you know, yeah. 20 years ago that, so if they had a little display curio cabinet, maybe there you go. they would have a home. Yeah. They would have a home and, with Rips doors and, and yep. you wouldn't have to dust them all the time so. right yeah see i guess mine mine is more like from a woodworking stand well no i take it back i like to stash nice pieces of wood away for turning projects that's kind of my oh, yeah. like stashing stuff like i just right. used one yesterday for a video that we salvaged from phil's house yeah. Yeah. um but i have a bad habit of like sitting on the couch watching something I don't really want to watch. AKA my wife's watching something that I don't want to watch and scrolling through Amazon, like adding random stuff in my cart. Like, Oh, this is good for a project coming up. Like probably two years ago, I ordered a bunch of um, nickel plates for nickel plating stuff. Okay. Cause I'm like, ah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to re nickel plate all these hand tools that I'm like, are, are toast. They're roasted. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to re nickel plate them. And it's going to be awesome shoved them in my shop and I just broke them out last two issues ago for the magazine to, to do some nickel plating. Um, mm -hmm. So I have the, I have a tendency to do that. Like I'll sit there and order stuff and like, right. Oh, this is gonna be really cool to use four years down the road. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think we've talked about this before too, whereas I like in the past have saved scrap pieces of wood from around here or from, you know, other projects where it's like, what size is the size of wood that's too big to throw away, but actually is really too small to do anything with? So I have that. But then I also have, uh, like, what was it? Not last October. So October 2020, you milled a humongous basswood tree mm -hmm. in, here in Des Moines. And we have video for that. And then you brought those planks in from that tree because there's several people in, on staff that are interested in carving, me included. And I thought, I need to do something with this plank of basswood. So I kind of want to do a carved shop sign for my workshop, mm -hmm. like the ones that Chris did. Um, so that's one of the projects that I've started in my head. And then probably one of the downsides of working at a place that has a fully equipped workshop in it is the temptation to not do the work that I need to do for work and go to the shop and work on something that is fun. So I have, well, I finished that clock that I showed last week, but I have a little tool tote for Dremel tools that I started on and my slot mortiser thing that I'm still working on mm -hmm. and a toolbox that I'm going to do for video. So I guess that's sort of work related, but it's still a project. And I feel like I have parts for something else. Yeah. So anyway, it's just kind of an interesting coping mechanism of when you don't get shop time that I've, you know, self-discovery. I'm just being real here. Yeah. 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 I think we made a lot of progress today, guys. Talk <laughs> this out. <laughs> oh, that's the other part. So Logan yesterday for a video that we do for woodworking essentials and part of our Woodsmith Unlimited uh, did a how to video on vessel turning. Mm hmm. And like he said, he used a piece of maple from one of the trees that he helped me 
take down from my yard last fall. I have a chunk of that as well. That's probably, it's like what, four inches thick by maybe 18 inches wide by, you know, almost 18 inches tall, yeah. 14 inches tall, something like that. So it's a pretty sizable piece of this soft maple. And I kept it because I, I'm hopelessly nostalgic. Uh, and I thought I'd make something that would be from the tree or trees that would remind us of it. And I've been struggling with what to do with it because I, I don't turn much and I'd hate to turn something that was hideous. So uh, I don't know how I stumbled across it again, but people who follow this podcast will know that I kind of fanboy Dave Fisher, a carver, and he does things called shrink pots, not unique to him. That's a tradition where you work with a green piece of wood, hollow out the inside, cut a groove at the bottom and slip a bottom into that groove that's just barely pops in. And then as the wood dries and shrinks, it shrinks around the bottom and shrink pot. Well, he did one that a few years ago that was kind of square. I'll put photos on it on a link where it's kind of a slightly tapered square shrink pot form that has, this one has like willow leaves carved into it and a portion of a poem. And I thought it would be kind of cool to do that with a section part of that piece from the tree where I could do, if I did it square, then each face could represent something from the tree. You know, like a one panel, I was thinking had maple leaves on it, another panel, helicopters, another panel, the, uh, the front tree, we had five years in a row, uh, a pair of barn owls, uh, not barn, barred owls <laughs> nest in there. And then the trees have always been home to all kinds of animals. And then on the fourth one, maybe doing like a carved uh, nut hatch or something like that would be kind of fun. So anyway, so Logan's turning made me think of doing a carved, carved vessel. Should be fun. Um, yeah. So how would you approach something like that? Like with what? what tools, what methodology? Uh, Cause I've done a couple kind of vessels like that, a couple mm -hmm. shrink pot things. Uh, what I've done is I have a brace and I use the biggest bit that I have for that, which is, I think is a one inch diameter. And I drill all the way through to just get it started. Mm -hmm. um, Cause they're usually too big for too long, I should say, for being able to drill through it at the drill press, which is a, another option. But you drill out the material as much as you can on the inside. And then using carving gouges, kind of peel your way out to your inside profile or diameter or whatever you want. And then on a couple of them, I've used a just a carving knife to carve kind of like a little V shaped groove near the bottom. And then, you know, pop the trace, trace a bottom onto a smaller piece of wood and cut that out at the bandsaw, bevel the edges, and then you can kind of press it into place and pop it in. Um, this is very short and abbreviated, but, yep. and then using, I usually use a draw knife on the outside to okay. get the profile, you know, draw knife, spoke shave, block plane, depending on how smooth and straight things are. Mm -hmm. um, on some of them I've done, the wood ended up getting pretty dry. So I could just use a rabbiting bit in the router table and just buzz a rabbit around the bottom of it and then glue in a, plywood bottom or something. Gotcha. So I was, I was asking because, um, one of the, one of the, it's not a project, but it's kind of one of the articles we're gonna be doing, uh, in this next issue of Poplet is going to be a 
kind of a like making tools spotlight. Um, I have a okay. uh, buddy here in town that is a very talented woodworker. But he's he's also a very t- very talented blacksmith too. So very much like our not 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 very different from Chris Fitch. Uh, kind of the same person. Uh, but. Andy is going to do a article for us on forging and ads, um, which I think would be kind of a cool article. So we're going to get into a little bit of carving work here in the next several issues. Um, and it's going to kind of start with this, you know, making your own tool with turning a ball peen hammer into an ads, which will be kind of cool. Yeah, I know. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Phil's ears just perked up. Yeah, I would love to have an ads. <laughs> yep. So, uh, so we're going to do a little article on taking an old vintage ball peen hammer, forging it out so it's nice and flat. Because then you don't have to worry about drifting an eye. It's already there, right? Right. And it's going to be an ad size for like small vessel or spoon carving, which would be kind of cool. And so I, I went hit a couple different thrift stores and picked a bunch of ads that we can melt down and <laughs> beat with a hammer and turn into little ads. So we got a bunch of little small ball peen hammers for little spoon ads. And we got, I got one, I found one that's like almost two pounds. It's, I mean, it's Holy like, crap. it's like that big, but it's still a ball peen hammer. I'm like, yeah, we're making dugout canoes now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're really peen some balls with those. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. No. I'll see myself out. <laughs> yeah, please. Am I doing this right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Now I'm interested in uh, see. And I know I've said this to you guys. It seems like green woodworking has kind of been the hipster thing the last couple of years to do. Right, which is why I hesitate sometimes to admit it because I, I just know. don't want to come across as being a sheep on that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, like, and hey, Phil, Phil unroll your cool. jeans, please. Yeah, I'm kind of, I fit my Gen X generation very well in being contrarian. So I'm uniquely contrarian, just like every other Gen Xer. Yeah. <laughs> But no, so it'll be interesting. I mean, I want to say the great woodworking thing kind of popped up, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago when, um, was it, Follinsby came on and started writing some stuff. Yeah. Um, Jenny Alexander. Yeah. And Doug, yeah. Or, uh, I guess. Drew Langsner in the 80s. I mean, that he. But it went from being very, very niche to much wider recognition. Yeah. Yep. That would agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. And did, Jenny Alexander was mainly chairs, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but like the whole like spoon carving thing, green carving thing, um, it just, to me, it makes me think of like people's Etsy stores, you know, selling their spoons, selling, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know why, and it's not right, but it's what I think of. Now we're going to have the Etsy crowd turning on us. Wow. You know, Antarja coming at us. Mm -hmm. Etsy. We're we're just here to piss off every branch of woodworking. Antargians, I think is what they call themselves. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. So if you need somebody to use, a small bowl ads that you're going to forge. I, I know a guy. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see how many we can make. So that'd be fun. Once we got, we got anything else <laughs> or is this the podcast? <laughs> yeah. Just a super exciting. This week. episode 100 man. comes and goes, goes and, and we're done. And we're out of gas. Yeah. yeah. No peace. You no know, one. One thing that I was going to bring up that's kind of related to what we were talking about is, and I think this has come more recognizable for me probably in the last year or so. And I hate to give you credit for this, Logan, but ever since you got your sawmill, like the delights of working with rough planks of lumber Mm -hmm. rather than the pre-prepared boards that you would get at a 
at a, a lumber yard or a woodworking store or something like yeah. that. We were talking about this the other day. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always one of those weird things. Cause I think being somebody that cuts lumber, dries it and sells it. Like it's one of those things that's like, I know that most people that are not woodworkers, which a lot of people I sell lumber to are not woodworkers. Um, they'll come out and they'll look at, like the like i have logs that are cut and stacked and stuff and they'll look at them and be like man those those look nasty like they're gray they're they're weathered like it's one of those things people are like ah, i don't i don't really i can go to menards and pay a little bit more and get you know maybe a smaller board but it's clean and looks good it's like right. well <clears throat> yeah but what you're getting here is not not what you see, I guess, is what yeah. I'm getting at. It's like, you know, you get stuff that's all nasty and grayed and it doesn't it looks like a barn board. I mean, it looks like right. it's something that's been nailed on a barn for the last 40 years. But then you send it through the planer and just below the surface, like the like you, I can grab a hand plane, and take a shaving off. And it's like, oh, yeah, there it is. Hello. You know, right. So yeah, it's like a treasure hunt. It is. You're not getting you're not going to the store and get your shiny little coins. You got to. Stuff yeah. you found in the ground and you cleaned it all up. And that's yeah. kind of the, some of the satisfaction in it is getting that rough gray wood. And then you're the one cutting around all the, the cracks and defects and cleaning it up. And it's nice because you can, you can uh, go through all that and get uh, lumber that was all from the same tree. You're not trying to go to the store and mm -hmm. pick grain and color and all that stuff that matches and yeah so yeah. yeah well and i think that's that's some of for me some of the joy about it is that you have complete control over it and if i have somebody come out to pick through lumber it's like hey you pick what you want man like i'll, I'll give you my suggestions but you pick what you want um it was like this watchmaker's cabinet i'm working on it's all quarters on um walnut you know i i went through and i picked every board that was quarters on because i know i wanted that nice straight grain on everything um like i would have a hard time going to a lumber yard and picking that out and if i did you know something that i i sell generally i sell walnut you know between five and six fifty a board foot i'd go to the store and spend three times that probably for walnut yeah you know um so it's 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 fun and i I think, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm just being pompous about this. I think starting from a rough board and going all the way through ultimately makes you a better woodworker. I think it makes you pay attention to stuff more, like grain patterns and the way grain is shaped and stuff like that. Rather than just saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to grab this plain on red oak and the the cathedrals are cut not to pick on red oak it just happens to have that really good cathedral pattern but like i'm not gonna pick out you know course on red oak and then all of a sudden my panels are gonna have cut off cathedral grains you know what i mean like then right. it looks like a mass yeah. produced piece that is you know they're just trying to glue up panels they don't really care what the grain looks like when you thoughtfully lay out grain and pay attention and this is something i've i've seen um something that pops off the top of my head is Matt Cremona. He's, he tries to pay attention to if he has like a curved rail, he tries to grab one of his pieces of lumber that has curved grain in it. And they'll cut his rail out of that curved grain area. Right. You know, it's just that, that thoughtfulness I think helps elevate your woodworking it to the next level. Right. Yeah. It's definitely a puzzle that you're on. Yeah. You're solving as you go, I guess you're thinking about what, parts of the logs and in the in the wood is is going to be what parts and what you can get out of and work around and so yeah, yeah it's part of the enjoyment and i think there's a i mean there's a strong element i mean part of the reason i think at least for me of doing woodworking is the creative expression and you really get to do that working with a full plank yeah. You know, a rough sawn boards, like you said, of being able to find grain specifically for a part instead of trying to feel like you have to maximize yield out of specific boards or, mm -hmm. 
you know, that there's that element too. And I, you know, like you said about um, helping you become a better woodworker, I think there's also, I want to word this carefully, I guess. Uh, I also got to the point as a woodworker where I felt like I could work with rough lumber, you know, cause there's a lot of people that don't have access to rough lumber. Totally cool. Yep. Not dissing people at that point. And that's a lot of the woodworking that I do is just with boards that you buy at the store because that's what's available and that's what you got. But having the ability to use rough sawn lumber is one thing. And then having the skills to know how to use rough lumber is another thing too, where yeah. in starting to use the rough lumber, it was like, oh, you know, I, I got to see where I've grown as a woodworker, where those, where those grain choices matter, but then also having the skill to use uh, a planer and a bandsaw well to maximize what you can out of those boards you know that you start with a you know a two inch thick rough sawn board yeah. and be able to resaw thinner parts out of that and knowing that you know i don't have to just grind this down into mostly mulch and a three-quarter inch thick board i can get a bunch of poor parts out of the same thickness yeah which i think is kind of fun is it you know, cause I will say, you know, I've said before that I really enjoy using a bandsaw and it's a fun tool, but there's a, a skill level to it of being able to go from like just rough cutting curves on a bandsaw to resawing thin pieces out of thick pieces and have them consistently sized and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, that was, that was something I noticed uh, as I'm, as I'm kind of working through this watchmaker's cabinet. Um, I mean, obviously I use rough lumber all the time. Um, and even when we buy, would you guys consider our Liberty stuff roughs on, or, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of semi rough. Yeah. We skip playing it, have them skip playing yeah. straight line it. Yeah. So it's like, it's not, yeah. it's not like going to Menards or Home Depot or Lowe's and buying a, a hardwood board. It's, there's still some work there, but it's at right. much further along than straight off the air drying yard like my stuff is. Um, there's, I think something that you said, Phil, that I, I guess a lot of people probably don't realize is you can really maximize your yield off of it. Because generally, if you end up with thicker stock, eight quarter stock, which you're not going to walk into Menards and buy, you're going to walk in and buy a right. three quarter inch board. Um you can legitimately resaw that down into two, three quarter inch pieces if you want. Or this walnut I was working with, I have, I, I cut it at five quarter um, and I needed to glue up a bunch of um, quarter inch panels. So I resaw them all down to half inch and I had plenty of room with a half inch uh, right. to plane them down. Um, so, yeah. so here's the, your shop notes podcast plug for your local sawmills is. <laughs> So it's funny. I just happened to look because we were talking about one of the upcoming Woodsmith projects is a um, Dylan designed like George Nakashima inspired piece. Right. Um, it, it keeps getting labeled room divider, but I don't think that's a good way to put it. It's more of like a cabinet. I don't know. Yeah, it's like a yeah, short when you said wardrobe room divider yeah. i was thinking like one of those you know folding That's panels that it's too. like i don't remember seeing that in the shop but i do remember seeing a cabinet so I, yeah, yeah exactly like, um but so steve johnson built that out of uh walnut and initially dylan had asked me if i had a slab of walnut for the top on it and i'm like oh yeah absolutely like i have a lot of slabs of walnut um i got a couple that are dry the rest of them are semi-dry but it ended up, they ended up asking me for a bunch of roughs on walnut uh, to build this out of. And I was like, ah, I have a thousand board feet that's sitting at the kiln right now. It's not dry yet. Um, but uh, so Steve went out and ordered the lumber and it ended up being fairly expensive. Now we're in the middle of Iowa. Walnut grows fairly readily around here. Yeah. Um, so most local mills, um, 
like I said, you know, I generally charge between five and six fifty seven bucks a board foot for walnut, um, which is pretty standard around here. I try to set my prices to be, uh, you know, competitive to people around here. You go to a lumber dealer around here. Um, Liberty Hardwood was at like, I want to say they were at like twelve bucks a board foot is what Steve ended up paying. Uh, the Woodsmith store here in town was at sixteen ninety nine a board foot. And get this, I just pulled up Menards. So this is the whole point of this thing. The whole point of this tangent I'm going off of is a one by six by eight foot at Menards, which is actually three quarter inch by uh, five and a half inches, is a total. I get get my calculator back up. Fifty eight dollars a board foot. Like I need to start selling to Menards. That's what I need to do. There you go. (laughs) Like, man. Like their their one by six by eight foot is two hundred and thirty three dollars. Oof. So, so if you're in Central Iowa, I have a lot of walnut I could sell you, along with some beautiful course on white oak and course on sycamore. So, right, all kiln dry. Were you were you factoring in the eleven percent rebate? I was not. <laughs> I was not. Because that was, changes everything. I was not. That and and when they have the fifteen percent off bag, it can be up to I think twice the height of the bag. Oh right. wow! So you gotta get a four footer, yeah. but mm-hmm. yeah, that's funny. So that's hilarious. So, so here's your plug for local sawmills. Find them on Craigslist. But you're also going to be Support able to find. Sawmill. You know, we've we've also talked about this before too, of being able to find materials that you may not find at oh, a yeah. lumber yard. Oh yeah. And also grain patterns that would usually get graded out. Yes. So if you want um so I know most I guess it depends on the type of sawmill you're going to. If it's a hobbyist, you're gonna find everything. Like right. You're gonna find, you know, rustic grade walnut. You're gonna find FAS walnut. You know, it just depends on what tree they get. Cause they're not going to be generally be picky upon their trees. Um, yeah. If you go to a bigger sawmill, let's call them, I mean, bigger than like a hobbyist sawmill. If you go to somebody that's doing this for a living, you're going to find generally a little bit better grade walnut. You might not find that super rustic stuff, um, yeah. but you'll also pay a little bit more probably. So, yeah. but you go to the hobbyist guys, like there's a guy here in town, um, Tom, uh, that runs a Norwood lm 2000 i think um and tom has a very cool setup he runs his mill his mill's name is millie and which i just put two and two together which i think is ridiculous that i never (laughs) put that together uh but he tom mills a lot of different things and he has a really cool setup where he has a little dehumidification kiln in his garage phil you've been there with brian and myself yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, and and Tom has a ton of different woods, and it's just it's one. He's the epitome of like picking up whatever he can and cutting right. it. So like yeah. he has like random apple pieces, walnut, mm-hmm. pear, cherry, Bradford locust. pear, locust. I mean, just like <laughs> everything. Which I'm kind of that way, where it's like I'll, if I can get it, I'll cut it. Um, right. but the guys I work with to get logs, they know I want the hardwoods. I want, I want furniture wood. Like I want enough to build something. I don't want personally. I want the little stuff, like weird stuff to turn stuff out of, but sure. for a big, big project wood, I want, I want good hardwood trees that there's enough volume there. Yeah. So, Yeah. Today's Sawmill Corner brought to you by Millie Hardwoods. <laughs> Serving the Des Moines metro area since 2006. Anyway, so that was just kind of just interesting to having done that, you know, like with the workbench that I did yeah. on video last year where you had that white fur and it was all rough sawn and being able to, you know, look at different planks and be able to find out like where I could get pieces out of. And mm-hmm. even those, unless it was really cracked or really loose knots, then you can take some of those secondary pieces or whatever and put them in places that just aren't in view. So they're yeah. hidden, but still usable, whatever. So, yeah, anyway, well, as, just, yeah, as I say, the other thing is, like as you said, if it's a secondary piece, you can throw it on the inside of a cabinet and you right. don't see it. That was one of the things I was thinking about. Um, 
this watchmaker's cabinet, there's a lot of handwork on it, a lot of hand tool work, a lot of hand planing, and, and you know, the large portion of this article is going to be sizing stock by hand. Yeah. Who cares if the inside of the panel is rough sawn still? Right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to smooth out the inside of the panel just to tell myself, oh, I, I know I inside that panel, I smooth that out by hand. Like, mm, yeah, doesn't really matter. You know, like, yeah. do you think that a, you know, if you go to the, the guys that are, that think hand tool work is the real epitome of fine woodworking, like, you think joiners from the, you know, 1800s went to the time to smooth off the inside of panels? Nope. Yeah. They had, they had an apprentice down the bench a little ways that was doing that. And it's like, Hey, get through them fast and don't worry about it. Yeah. So I think what's also interesting in going from using rough lumber too and resawing is, you know, a lot of times, you know, with woodworking plans, there's an assumption there that a lot of the plans project pieces are designed around commonly available material. Mm-hmm. So a lot of our projects have as a basis three quarter inch thick material because that's what's available easily. And we don't want to waste people's money and or time by having them grind stuff down to custom thicknesses a lot. So, but working with a thick rough sawn blank, now you can work any thickness if that suits the look of the project that you're working with or uh, just makes better sense economically or something like that. You know, or a lot of times, for example, drawer parts, unless they're gigantic drawers, can be three eighths of an inch thick. And that's plenty thick for Mm -hmm. drawer parts, even thinner. But we're not going to advocate for that in the magazine plans because three eighths inch thick material is not easy to find. And if you don't have a planer or you don't really want to just grind stuff down to that thickness, you know, there's almost no point in specking that. You know, so like even for three quarter inch stuff, like if it's a smaller project, maybe five eighths looks better or seven eighths or whatever. You know, that those kind of numbers almost become irrelevant then because you can just, you know, if I can get three pieces of five eighths out of this eight, eight quarter instead of two three quarter inch pieces, then, you know, you've made made good use of great looking material. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, there was a time not not too long ago that seven eighths was a common size. Yeah. You know, and one of the things I like personally um, is the ability to use those different thicknesses. Like, even though, yeah, we design stuff around common, uh, common sizes. I like the ability to be able to, you know, from a, from a having thicker lumber, five quarter lumber, or you know, six quarter, whatever, being able to mix and match thicknesses for different effects. You know what I mean? Um, like there's times where adding a seven eighths inch top looks better than a three quarter inch top to something. Right. You know, like this, yeah. this watch radio scan I'm working on, for example, has three quarter inch sides. All parts are pretty much three quarters inch, except the, the, the base is doubled up with some blocking to make it an inch and a half thick. And then yeah. the top is going to be a seven eighths inch thick. So it gives you visually it adds weight to certain areas um, and it gives you a little bit more options to do with moldings. Um, you can't sure. fit that big a profile on a three quarter inch, but adding an extra eighth inch gives you a little bit more room to add a, you know, a fillet here or there on a molding. So I like that ability to um, mix and match those sizes where it is correct. There are some designs and we talked about some of them, Phil, like where you see a design and you're like, yeah, that just looks heavy. It right. looks too heavy. Like the material that was used just is too thick for what the project is, like a, a wine server or something. Um, right. It's like, yeah, those could have been a little bit thinner. So I've also started seeing, you know, like a lot of times in projects and materials, we'll use, we'll get eight quarter material from our hardwood suppliers and then we'll have eight quarter leftovers. 
And that clock that I made showed last week, um, I was able to use that to my advantage where with thicker material like that, even though it wasn't a rough sawn piece, I could now use the quarter sawn face of it and resaw sections and get real straight grained walnut on there. And uh, we have an episode coming up for season 16 of the TV show where we're going to do three different clocks. Um, and the clock that I'm using is this stickly mantle clock that appeared in Popular Woodworking Magazine. I did a version of it for my brother several years ago, but I just really like the, the design of it. And this one was made with quarter sawn white oak because stickly. Mm -hmm. But I thought um, it'd be fun to try a different material. And we had some just long square pieces of eight quarter beach left over. And plain sawn beach, I think, can look really nice and does. It's got a real mellow color and grain to it. But the quarter sawn faces are kind of speckly, kind of like white oak, but not as heavily flaked or flecked or whatever. So I thought if I would take that and now resaw those pieces and get panels for this clock, I think it can look really cool. So that's what I'm going to do. I think that'll be it'll be kind of fun. Was that that uh, beach that was sitting in the video studio? Yes. See, I thought as I walked by that, that is the one tree that I wish grew in Iowa. Yeah. Because I would love, I've heard, I've heard it can be a beach to saw, but I like, no, seriously, like I've heard it doesn't dry very nicely, but uh, I would love to be able to cut some. I mean, East Coast, it, it grows pretty well, I think. Yeah. Near the um, ocean, I think. Yes. I <laughs> That was so much better than mine. I hate you, John. Yeah, that was so much better. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, up but, on the beaches are terrible. Yes, they're they're awful. They get really cold. Uh, yeah. But no, I like it's a it's what I would consider a utility wood. But it's a nice utility wood, right? Like, yeah. yeah, it's I don't know. I just I. I enjoy working with it, so yeah, I yeah. It's I not some. like quite as hard and chippy as like maple, but it's yep. still, you know, it's not like soft like poplar, or yeah, sure. birch or, or that kind of thing. I have a I have a prod uh, workbench build coming up for pop wood, and I was like, what do I got that I have cut that I don't have to buy because I don't want to buy the lumber. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to buy it. Like, that's stupid. Who buys lumber? Um, but, like, I was thinking beach would be a really nice top on sure. on the on bench. bench. Yeah. yeah. But I just don't have any. I just really yep. would like to cut some. So if any of our friends on the East Coast have some beach logs that you want to haul to Iowa for me, let's do it. <laughs> Free sawing for you. <laughs> There you go. Yep. All right. Anything else you guys got going on? New nope. projects? John says nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. All done. I I mean, I, I beat the watchmaker's cabinet to death. One thing I did by staying on the lumber kick, you guys saw my recent auction buy. Bought a bunch of oh. boxwood from an English tool auction and it showed up. Well, talk about the freaking coolest thing in the world. Like it, <laughs> it is so heavy and so dense. It grows so slow because boxwood is like a, it's a shrub. Let's be honest. Yeah. It's not a tree. It's a shrub and it takes forever to grow to any size. I was doing photography yesterday with our gardening photographer, um, Jack, and I showed him a piece of it. He's like, Oh my God, that's huge. I was like, yeah, it's, takes forever. I mean, they have these plantations in England that they used to be crown uh, plantations where the the king and queen owned the land and they planted these boxwood plantations to harvest for lumber, uh, for yeah. tools. And they still have some of them. Uh, the crown doesn't own them anymore. But uh, like, yeah, you get these 200 year old boxwood shrubs mm. that they cut down and harvest. And somehow I bought a box of it. 
And so are those the same plant as the little like boxwood bushes yes. I can get at Menards? Yes. yes. Grow into. Yes. Yeah. Huge. 300 years later. Yes, wow. exactly. Yeah. Which is why, I mean, yeah, that's, there's a bunch of different species and there's actually, there's a, I think Argentinian boxwood. Um, or no, I'm sorry. That's Argentinian lignum vitae. Uh, this is uh, Costello boxwood. Costello boxwood, I think, grows like in the Mediterranean. Um, and it's it's like one of those, it's like it's similar, but it's not actually English boxwood. I don't know how how closely they work. Uh, but yeah, it's it's awesome. I cut a, a piece of it in half the other day. And I showed Phil, I was like completely wood nerding out. I'm like, dude, look how easily this files. I can grab a half round and you file it like metal where most yeah. wood leaves fuzzy fibers and stuff. Oh, so yeah. nice. There's going to be so many planes made out of this and chisel handles. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Boxes. Boxes <laughs> from boxwood. Right. Yeah. I think it would turn finials really nice too, probably. Oh, yeah. I mean, if it did some finials, it would probably hold a detail really nice. So, Chest pieces. Yes. So that was my exciting thing for the last couple of weeks. All right. I spent more on shipping than I did actually buying the boxwood because it was so dang heavy. So, well, and coming from the, the UK, too. Yeah, so. that's true. I tried I tried to get our supplier of these diamond stones that come from the UK to like smuggle me some boxwood. <laughs> but he refused to go to jail for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. That's crazy. All right. I think that wraps up another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Uh, don't forget to check out our show notes page where I'll put links and photos to some of the things we've been talking about so you can see what's going on. You can watch the podcast on our YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to please leave reviews and ratings at your local podcastery so that we can get more viewers and listeners like you who are interested in the show. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, I want to hear about them. You can leave them on our YouTube channel or email them woodsmith at woodsmith.com. And we'll see you next week for the Shop Notes podcast. Bye, everybody. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build from furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs, and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.